All right, everybody had your caffeine. I'm going to get you through this without a whole lot of data. But what I wanted to do is uh, actually kind of a part two of the, what's the wonderful world waiting birds and the watershed, something like that. Um, basically, go through kind of the methodology that we employ uh, to basically determine what is that little white speck in the trees as you're dipping by at about 100 and some knots in an airplane. Um, National Audubon Society, and specifically Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, we have been monitoring specifically the wood storks here at the sanctuary going back to 20 some years ago when Ted Below uh, started this when he was here as a resource manager and I was just a little intern at the time uh, going up in the plane with him. And we started just with the corkscrew colony here and then over time, I'm not sure how this happened, but uh, possibly evolved out of a study that we did on the, the wood stork foraging. But we picked up uh, four more sites in this area of Southwest Florida. So what I wanted to do is just kind of explain what I typically do on a wading bird monitoring flight, and then after the flight, what gets done to provide some sort of useful information that then goes into the entire wading bird report for the Southeastern United States. So uh, I'll go back real quick. We uh, look at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, we look at a site, uh, Baron Collar 29, some other ones out there. I'll show you all this uh, real quick here, one by one. Um, use methodology very similar to what Tiffany employs uh, when she does her wading bird flights. The only difference is we are not looking at like foraging groups or anything, we're looking specifically at the nesting colonies. Uh, again, we employ a Cessna 172 aircraft uh, we do our monitoring basically by hanging out the window and taking pictures. We use a, a digital camera with a 300 millimeter lens. We found that's the ideal focal length. If you go too far, you know, as far as the focal length, you might be able to get this nice zoomed in picture of the bird, but it's such a narrow field of view that it makes it really, really, really difficult to try to keep track of all those birds. Um, we just upgraded to a camera that's got about four times the resolution of what I was shooting with in this picture here. And it's got the capability of using much, much higher ISOs. So it's, it's already proven effective this year at being much better as far as a tool to photograph these birds and get good usable images. Because when you're zipping along at 500 feet off the ground, about 100 knots, it's really difficult to tell whether or not you're looking at a four-week-old chick or a six-week-old chick or, or what it might be. You have to rely on those photos. And again, we use the same sort of methodology where we go over our nesting colony, we take a wide-angle shot and a series of those close-ups. And just like Tiffany uh, covered in her presentation, we use that, sort of overlay those images and do a final count. On the smaller colonies, or in years where there's just not too many nesting birds, it's pretty easy to do a quick tally off just maybe two or three photos. But in other years or other colonies where there's a lot of birds, that's where Photoshop really comes in handy because you can go through and put just a little digital dot over each bird that you counted to keep track of it. Take a step back in time. Before I started this, before, when Jason Lowerson was here doing this, it was before digital photography. We were using film, we were using slides. Okay. Uh, so Sean, somewhere there might be a whole batch of slides <laughs> snatched away as data. But what we used to do is project those images onto a screen like this with an overlay grid and just sit here and one by one go and count the grid. Okay, so our typical waiting bird flight, we start at Naples Airport. From there, we zip right on up to Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. Nesting occurs within the horseshoe-shaped old-growth cypress that is uh, <coughs> the heart of Corkscrew Swamp. From there, take a short hop over to the east to Baron Collar 29. We have a man-made island that sits right uh, west of State Road 29. You can actually see the wading birds nesting on that photograph there. Short hop to the northeast to Collard Hendry Line, and we have a very unique sort of arrowhead shaped uh, cypress <coughs> forest there. Then we zip on up to the Caloosahatchee River to a very small mangrove island just east of I-75. Again, you can see a few birds, possibly nesting <coughs> roosting there. 
and then make a short hop down the river to a larger mangrove island called Lenore Island. Once we finish those sites, basically let's just head on back home down the beach, <laughs> back to Naples Airport. <laughs> Whole flight usually takes somewhere an hour and a half to two hours long, depending on how many birds are up there nesting. Uh, it can sometimes take a little bit longer in the really good years. Okay, starting at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. Historically, the wood storks nested throughout that horseshoe shaped old growth forest here. Um, I hate using this little pointer on this, but historically, they nested right over top of the boardwalk. And they would be scattered throughout that entire horseshoe shape. More recent years, they have not been nesting in those areas right off the boardwalk. There's been the one scattered <coughs> little sub colony down on the southeast corner, just north of the bird birthery swamp. Maybe a little pocket over on the west side, and then this kind of big, diffuse area over the northern forest where they're scattered all over the place. Because this can change from year to year, and even over the course of a season, one little group can spread into one larger group or three groups merge together. When we record this for the waiting bird reports, that lat long coordinate, it's actually right dead center in the middle of the marsh. Here's a look at Corkscrew Swamp over the northern section. Okay, this is one of those wide angle views. And this again shows that sort of diffuse spread out nesting. Uh, makes it really difficult, you know, to try to go through the photos. Like Tiffany was saying, you have to kind of look for key landmark features, like this snag right here would be one of them. So when you zoom in on certain areas, you look for those, those little landmark features to keep track of all the, the images. A little bit easier on areas, this is that little pocket down on the southeast corner of the old growth forest. This is, we're actually flying north over the the central marsh looking eastward towards that colony there. And this one you can see it's a much tighter grouping of nesting birds, a lot easier to keep track of everything in that image. Okay, Baron Collar 29. Again, this is a, a human made island, it's an old agricultural area. And the birds nest out here on top of a bunch of old Brazilian pepper trees. That's about <laughs> all that's out there. Um, even in the years when corkscrew is not uh, an active nesting site, there's almost always some sort of activity going on out here at Barrett Collar 29. Um, not necessarily a whole lot of stork activity, but at least some egrets nesting there. So far this year, this site has been empty as well. <coughs> Okay, Collier Hendry Line is a rather infrequently used site. Again, it's got that unique sort of I don't know, arrowhead shape uh, to it. But what we find here is the center flag pond. You see a few scattered cypress trees in there. And if you look real carefully, you can kind of make out some little white blips in the center of those trees. That's where the storks nest. Those scattered cypress right in the middle of that, that open area. <coughs> But again, it's a very infrequently used site. We usually fly over just to check, but it's only had some nesting activity in uh, maybe one, two years, the past 10 that I can recall. Okay, Caloosahatchee East. As you're driving north over the Caloosahatchee River on I-75, if you look off to one side, you'll actually see a little manatee sculpture. And just beyond that is Caloosahatchee East, a small mangrove island. Um, as you're flying from the sites over by Immokalee and flying kind of northward, you kind of skirt around the International Airport and use a landmark of the power plant in the distance. And as you're kind of homing in on that, you see that island off in the distance in the river. And then uh, you check, make sure it's got that little sculpture out there and know that you're on the right one and zip in to take all your photos. Yeah, those are manatee sculptures. <laughs> okay, Lenore Island, by the way, that last one sits right near the Manatee area where they come in by the power plant. That's why it's here. Okay, Lenore Island, sometimes known as Caloosahatchee West. This is obviously west of the I-75 overpass. This again is another one of those sites that even in the, what I would consider a bad year, where things aren't really nesting too much, there's always some activity, it seems like, in Lenore. 
this year, so far, nothing. Uh, we were due to do, we were due to do a flight. We were due for a flight yesterday morning, but because of the weather, it was scrubbed. Uh, so we won't get up again probably for about another week and a half, and we'll be able to check on this site at that time. But here's what we do. Okay, take pictures, get a wide angle view, and this is actually kind of a super wide angle view, as was that one of uh, corkscrew on the north end. Um, but what we do is we take all those little white dots and we zoom in to try to figure out which size bird are we looking at. And again, we're focused on the wood storks. And so as we go through there on each flight, the information from one flight builds upon information from the previous flights so that you can get an idea of, okay, what size birds uh, we're looking at here. That gives you an estimate of how many birds actually initiated nesting, how many chicks were basically fledged out is the bottom line at the end of everything. All right, so to start with, here's a picture taken early in the nesting season. Uh, I don't remember what year, but uh, it's kind of arbitrary. This is a photo taken in January. And what I want to point out here are a couple of things. Right in the very center almost, y'all see that? Bird right here? Okay, this is the one I actually photoshopped to get the eggs out of the nest. But, see how this one is standing over a nest platform, there's no obvious eggs or chicks in the nest. Okay? That bird does not get counted. Okay? That is a bird that has set up a nest platform, but it has not initiated nesting. So, until it actually has something in the nest, as far as eggs, it doesn't get counted. However, if it is like one of this, like this bird here, any of these ones that are actually perched down, sitting on the eggs, okay, those are brooding. Those get counted as an active nest. Or if it's like this individual here, where it's obviously got mm -hmm. eggs, or this individual way over on the left hand side. Got eggs or possibly a little chick, that gets counted as an active nest. So those are successful nest initiations. Now those individuals that you see that are in the brooding position, we count those as successful nest starts. We don't know for sure what they're sitting on in terms of the, the, age, the age of the egg. So that egg was laid sometime between zero and three weeks prior to this photo. From the time they lay that egg, it takes three weeks to it hatches out. So on the second flight, we look at the age of the chicks to determine roughly when that nest was initiated. So we can tell if we're looking at chicks on the subsequent on the second flight that are roughly two weeks old, we can backtrack to the time of the first flight to determine, okay, those birds that were in that brooding posture. Were they sitting on a, an egg that was just a day old, or were they sitting there already for two or three weeks? Does that make sense? Just based on the age of the chick in the subsequent flight. So each flight, again, it builds upon the information from the previous one. <clears throat> okay, so here's a flight uh, photo from sometime probably around February. Obvious chicks in the nest. Here's what I want to point out to everybody. How many chicks do you see on that nest? Two, two, three. How many people see two? How many people see four? Do you see four little heads? Maybe. Maybe. Take a look at the branch. See the double image? Two branches. See the egret wings? Double wings. The adult bird? Double head? This is one of the problems when you're flying along. You get vibration, it produces a double image. So if you look at that real carefully, if you look at it real quick, you might initially think, oh wait, I see it looks like four possible hits and there are four chicks. Uh-uh, that's two. But these are the two-week age class. Tiny little birds, they just hatched out. So from the date of this flight, we're looking at birds that are at least two weeks old. They're not at four weeks of age yet, but they're at least at the two week age class. So from there you can backtrack roughly two weeks to hatching time, and another th 
three weeks to test initiation time. And if everything works out, you use that second flight, the data from the timing of the first flight, to pinpoint when those eggs basically were laid, when the nest was initiated. Okay, so there's the two week age class. Here's the four week age class. I want to point out something unique here. Notice how nice and sharp and clear this image is? <laughs> this is the difference between using a helicopter versus a fixed wing aircraft. Uh, we're zipping along at over 100 knots and trying to take pictures of these, the airplane's bouncing around. You have to get up early in the morning because thermal start rising and gets rough, it makes it very difficult to take photos. The other thing is we hit corkscrew first because besides the wood storks, we got a couple of hundred vultures that roost out here. And you end up having to dodge those if you don't get out here by about 9.30 in the morning. So uh, helicopter is a much more stable platform. Unfortunately, it's like three or four times as expensive to use, so we can't make use of those for uh, what would actually be a better monitoring effort. Um, keep track of everything. But I just wanted to point out here's your four week age class. Okay, and then we finally get up to the six week and older age class here. And wood stork is officially fledged at eight weeks of age. They can force fledge as early as seven weeks and be you know, a survivable bird at seven weeks old. So on a flight late in the season, say around May, if we see a bunch of birds that are at six weeks old, more than likely, those are going to fledge. They are going to be completely successful. Um, and this is what it looks like. By this time, this is out over Lenore Island. You're looking down at an area that is almost completely whitewashed, like Guano, and you've got birds sitting on there. It makes it a little challenging to pick out birds sometimes against the white background. But what we're looking at here are birds at the six week age class, every one of those things or chicks that more than likely are going to fledge. We would count every one of those as a successful fledge. Now, more than likely also, we would do, if possible, one more flight after the May flight. You know, we do another one in June just to confirm that. But as you get further and further into the rainy season, those if there's other birds, and by the way, storks are asynchronous uh, egg layers. So you might have some that initiate nesting in January and other ones that come in in March and May and, and they, they don't synchronize the breeding ever. So at this time here, we might have birds that are six or seven weeks old, ready to fledge out, and we have a nest somewhere else on a tree nearby that has two week old chicks on the nest. And we know by May, you know, if you got birds out there in the two week class, four week class, they're not gonna survive simple as that. So really at May, if we have birds at this size class right here, we count those as successfully fledged. And anything younger than that, we don't count those. They're not going to make it. And then ultimately all that goes into data on a table. Uh, this gets submitted here. This is the one actually from this previous season. Um, we started with 270, well we didn't start with that, but we had a total of 270 nests. Of those, we lost a few. Some of those were abandoned. So of the ones that were actually started, that actually had birds that laid eggs, that were successfully trying to start a nest, only 160 of those actually produced chicks that fledged. Okay, and of the 160 that produced fledglings, this is the number of fledglings that were produced. So roughly two chicks for every one nest. And that's usually about the ratio, I can't remember what it is exactly, it's like 2.25 storks per nest that typically fledge. Okay, we are focused here at Corkscrew primarily on the wood stork. So we have much more detailed information on this uh, for all the sites that we monitor. But we also keep track, to some degree, of the great blue herons, great egrets, small white, you can't tell from a plane. It could be little blue heron, it could be ibis, it could be cattle egret, you don't know really. 
and small, dark, same thing. Uh, a lot of times you can tell the difference really between an anhinga and a little blue heron, but sometimes the plane's vibrating too much, you know, you don't get a good image. So uh, for these, this just represents the successful nest starts. It doesn't keep track of the chicks or anything in that detail. Okay, so historically, this is what has happened here. A lot of you have seen this kind of information before. 1850 and into the early 1900s, the very first Audubon Wildlife Warden to come into the Berkshire Rookery reported 100,000 wood storks. That's just the storks. That's not including the spoonbills, the egrets, the herons, everything else that could have been nesting here. 100,000 wood storks at Berkshire. Roughly two and a half million wading birds throughout southern Florida. Now we're at 100,000 wading birds of all species in the region. That's a 96% loss, if I calculated that correctly. Uh, we've been keeping track of things here at Corkscrew uh, from about 1958 onward. You can see what's happened here. Uh, tremendous nesting success back in the early 60s. By the mid 60s into the mid 70s, up to the mid 70s, dropped off a little bit, but still producing quite a number of birds. And then by around 1980 or so, uh, tremendous drop off. And what's the reason for that? Everyone's seen Jason's map before. Here it is. All the shallow, the, the short hydro period wetlands. And Mika, I think, produced this slide uh, on one of her her presentation earlier. These are the short hydro period wetlands in pink. These are the areas that the storks and other wading birds rely on critically. And that's what's happened to it. Gone. So over time, the loss of those natural wetlands has led to a decline in nesting here at Corkscrew and elsewhere. So back when the sanctuary first formed, we're looking at over here the number of birds fledged out and we're talking up in the thousands. And here we are today, 300. This, by the way, was the first uh, successful nesting, uh, 2014, first successful wood stork nesting here at Corkscrew in five years' time. Uh, what's happened, we've been in a drought cycle for like almost the past 10 years. We've had two particular particularly bad drought periods, but overall the past 10 years have kind of been more or less a drought cycle. The natural drought conditions, the natural loss of these areas that storks and other wading birds rely on, when that occurs compounded with the human caused loss of these wetlands, you have detrimental effects. It used to be that the wading birds, you know, would just, you know, if they lost an area from natural conditions, just take off to a different area. And now there's no other places for them really to go. So they come in around September, they forage around, if they can't find enough food, they got to move elsewhere to where they can't find enough food to support themselves and a nesting effort. And that's about it. Any questions? Maureen. Have you thought about using drones? Yes. <laughs> and no. <laughs> it, it's real difficult now to, and you kind of saw like with Tiffany's images, you know, where you've got to do the wide angle and then overlay, you know, to get your zoomed in images. These pictures that I showed you, those were like as zoomed in as you could get and still have a usable image to discern, you know, what bird you were looking at and what age class. With a drone, you have the problem of you've got to be able to, I guess, if you have a can I don't know exactly how they work real effectively. So I don't know if it's going to be effective at getting that image and then moving down the colony, getting another image and keeping track and make sure that you overlap enough that you're not missing any birds really is the bottom line. Uh, I just don't know how effective it is. I guess if there was some automated thing where you could, you know, just go down and zip off images, it might work. But I think you can see, depending on which one, see what the camera on the drone sees. That's what I was thinking, yeah. So there might, there's probably some application. You'd have to play with it, probably get a professional initiative. Yeah. Yeah, but 
Yeah. Way to go in the future.